Uh, this is my uh, talk, and uh, Sandeep Kulkarni, he was my master's student, um, and we did this. I'm not, this is actually not my, what do you call, uh, field of specialization. I'm more into fluid mechanics and other things. I'm in the mechanical engineering department at uh, Vishwakarma Institute of Technology, but I'm interested more in numerical methods and uh, use the rational spectral method. I thought the plate uh, deflection was a very good uh, mean. I thought a good uh, this thing to work on. So that's why I took it up. So we are basically looking at uh, mainly right now rectangular plates with both uh, constant and variable thickness. Plate uh, is generally what we consider as a plate. We can define as a plate as something which has the thickness is very small compared to the other dimensions. And plate is, yes, usually it is uh, flat. Okay, almost straight. No, variable thickness means it won't be flat. Okay, so I think, uh, <coughs> so it won't be exactly flat, but for example, an aircraft wing can be considered to be like a plate. Okay, it doesn't have significant curvature. The median line will not have curvature, I think. Okay, probably, uh, I mean, a civil engineer may be, anyway, that's okay. That is, uh, <coughs> both constant and variable thicknesses were considered. We looked at uh, deflection of plates as well as vibrations were also considered. I have not given the results for vibration of plates. So look, we look at the governing equation for a plate, especially for constant thickness. This is the uh, equation. The, this is a biharmonic operator and Q is the uniform loading, which not, not necessarily uniform, loading on the plate per unit area. And D is the, the flexural rigidity, which is given by this. The E is the, what do you call that, uh, length modulus. H is the thickness. Mu is the Poisson ratio. They are basically material properties and thickness. I have given a tilde here because D I want to use later for the derivative matrix. That's why I use that. So this thing and the, to the strangle is the Laplacian operator. And uh, so Laplacian square will be the biharmonic operator. It's basically we have to solve this partial differential equation of biharmonic operator on W is the deflection which we would like to calculate, compute numerically. That is the main problem with corresponding boundary conditions. Okay. And so for numerical method solution, the biharmonic operator was split into two equations. The Laplacian of W was called as M and uh, this thing of, again, Laplacian of this thing was called given as Q by D. It's just splitting the fourth order equation. The biharmonic will be a fourth order equation. It was split into two second order equation because based on experience, I mean other things, the implementation of especially the boundary conditions, it's much easier when you do this splitting. Uh, it becomes much more convenient to implement boundary conditions in the second order. So that's why you have done it because you now you have two variables W and M you will have one uh, set of boundary conditions for W and one for M. So you will have essentially two condition, two places to impose the boundary conditions. Otherwise, uh, it becomes a bit uh, difficult to do that. <coughs> this gives us better accuracy also numerically. Though analytically, we prefer the other way, having one equation which is a higher order equation. Okay, this is the main thing. The spectral method, we have what are called as collocation uh, derivative matrices for dx and dy. What we do is that suppose you have a 1D case, we divide the domain into some n uh, number of nodes in the 1D. And if a classic of finite difference, all we have is that for derivative relates the uh, function value of the function at the point and then the neighboring points this side i plus 1 i and i minus 1 for a second derivative or a first derivative if you are using central difference i plus 1 and i minus 1. The rational spectral method, what it does is it fits a rational polynomial and so all the points in the domain are included in the derivative expression. The derivative includes all the points in the domain. Okay, that is the main uh, this thing. Of course, what happens is the matrix will be a whatever matrix uh, equation you get. In the finite difference, it will be in 1D, it will just be a single tridiagonal matrix if you are having. Here, it will not be a tridiagonal matrix, it will be a full matrix, but the size will be smaller. Okay, instead of having 1000, we can have something like 32. I mean, I, okay, I don't want to give the exact numbers, but order of magnitude, it will be lower. Okay. So, and that derivatives have been uh, 
available in the literature. So for I mean we can have the derivative matrices. <coughs> Similarly, dxx second derivative matrices are also available. So this means that if you have any uh, uh, any uh, variable w, then you say the variable w is a variable. dw by dx is a vector I have included because that is what I mean to say is that you have. Uh, <coughs> w at all the points, say if you have, if you have a just a 1D domain, W0 to Wn is your vector, you can, you have the collocation points, that is your vector and the derivative of that, all the, at each one of these points can be written in this way, D matrix, D, the matrix, the derivative into the function, that derivative matrix is what we have. So, <coughs> basically we can convert the uh, differential uh, this thing can convert it into an algebraic system that is the main thing. I mean it is the same thing we do in finite difference also though we do not present it in the form of a matrix we just write the equation and directly convert it. Here we have to use the matrix this one. So <coughs> the discretized system basically becomes something like this. This is a Laplacian uh, of W. Uh, minus m equal to 0 because Laplacian of w equals m basically the same equation now written in a matrix form okay. and so that we have to solve this equation system of equations now the d these are all matrices known matrices so we have to solve this system uh, corresponding with the corresponding boundary conditions <coughs> boundary conditions how it is imposed is this that is um, Suppose you are having a point which is on the boundary, then you do not apply the governing equation. What you apply is the corresponding boundary condition. What you do is that you remove that whatever that uh, matrix, whatever row you get for the corresponding to that boundary condition, you remove that row, I mean remove that equation and put the equation corresponding to the boundary condition. That is how uh, this was imposed. Okay. And uh, we had three conditions simply supported clamped and free boundaries. Uh, simply supported means there is just a simple support which means that the uh, <coughs> displacement will be 0 and uh, the moment will be 0 that is <coughs> and uh, clamped means it is just clamped so both uh, displacement as well as the slope at that point will be 0 and free means it is just free there is no uh, moment and the, as well as that modified shear force they are both 0. That is that. That's that's uh, just a way you have to impose it, and we compare the results <coughs> against uh, various uh, standard cases. Uh, S stands for simply supported, uh, C stands for clamped, and F stands for free. And uh, I mean, these are the four edges. One I mean, SSSS means all four edges are simply supported. And the thing is that comparison. The first case is a standard analytical case. The other three, my my this thing is that I think. Uh, the what was we, we I think we should have tried a little bit more maybe the results available we got from uh, uh, the certain uh, books they were they had uh, I think a couple of series Galerkin solution probably I think we are matching but we should have uh, <coughs> got better this thing what we should have done is probably try to see whether somebody had done more uh, solution with more number of terms. Our solution anyway we check for self consistency that is we check for by increasing the number of modes we got the same result back again. The first one being the SSSS that is a closed form solution that is there is no problem that we matched it exactly. <coughs> and the other one was next we looked at variable thickness case it is the same thing it is just that the equation is a little bit uh, messy that is the only thing. Because the thickness h varies with the x and y, so you have the derivatives of that d everywhere. It's just a messy equation. That's all. Otherwise, it's basically the same thing. And here we didn't have any uh, comparison, so we looked at uh, <coughs> we looked at just Naka aerofoils and looked for various conditions and uh, got the results. And uh, the codes were. Uh, I mean, of course, they were open source. They were written from first principles. We had uh, Fortran codes were written, and for uh, LU decomposition <coughs> standard routine was taken from the net netlib. And in the case of vibrations, we had taken uh, another. I mean, another eigenvalue uh, routine from uh, again from netlib. Uh, in this case, we didn't. I mean, probably 
uh, where Scilab could have been, uh, we could have used it, uh, would have been to plot the deflection profiles of the plate. That would have been, I think, very useful because we have the deflection at all the points. And another important thing is this, uh, once in the rational spectral method, even though we are getting the value at some discrete points, let's say 16, uh, what, what we can do is this later, <coughs> if you want at any other point, we can use the very higher order, the rational spectral interpolation to get a very smooth curve. That is, we don't need to, uh, I mean, you don't need any other lower order interpolation like spline or something. We'll get a very accurate solution at every point in the domain. So we could have uh, probably the next, I mean, we could have uh, shown it uh, that way. That is, uh, shown the actual picture of deflection of the plate. We could have been shown that, uh, I think there, Scilab could have been, uh, would have been very helpful. How do you mean, how can, I would like to know, how can I interface my Fortran code with the, give the results to Scilab and plot it, that uh, interface probably, uh, I think I would also like to know. So that please can, head to the conclusion. Ah, yes, that's all, I'm done. Thank you. Uh, okay, that's, that's all, uh, I think. Uh, and we want to extend it to non-rectangular cases as well. Any questions or queries? Uh, uh, good talk. I have uh, only one comment. You said that uh, you used uh, some Portran code and so on. Right. Um, so if you, you had used uh, Scilab, uh. You were, uh, the same code would have been used. Uh, for example, LAPAC would have been called. Uh for doing LU decomposition, uh, finding the solution, because right. it has to be solved repeatedly. Right. So the main benefit would have been uh, not just to plot. Plotting is okay, mm -hmm. but even the coding uh, would have been a lot simpler. You would have got the same performance, and there would have been uh, possibly less uh, uh, mm -hmm. shorter development cycle. Okay. So I would uh, uh, suggest maybe in, uh, some of your other students, you can ask them to redo this in Scilab okay. and you see the code size would definitely come down maybe one tenth. Are you sure? One yeah, tenth? yeah, absolutely. Because okay. that is a, a Scilab uh, is a high perform, high productivity tool while okay. giving the same performance, mm. high productivity tool because you can easily validate whether it mm. is working and mm. you may want to try it in the future. Sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, just one comment because uh, previously, some of my students, I didn't uh, encourage them, but they used MATLAB. At that time, my only pro problem was that when the matrix size became quite large, crossed 800, around 1000, that range, mm -hmm. then it became, started becoming very, very slow. Whereas then, when I switched to Fortran, I didn't have this problem. So that is one issue, I don't know whether, I mean, it may be something inherent with MATLAB or this one. I, that is one reason I... Yeah, good point. When the thing becomes very large, there are some issues. But of course, uh, the students often tend to choose um, large, um, uh, small discrete size because they don't use the proper integration methods. They may use explicit method and things like that. And it may diverge. So they choose the grid size very small. Mm -hmm. Where There are uh, different ways to address that issue. Mm. Of course, when the problem becomes very large, then, uh, you know, Fortran may be something you could try. No, because yeah. last time, I mean, another similar problem was stress, and, uh, stress concentration I tried in one case. There, we need to have a very refined, uh, this thing, number of points near that uh, stress concentration yes. point. After that time, we couldn't uh, proceed Good. further. Okay. We can just I mean, I'm very happy if the code size reduces. That is no, it will be a good feedback for us, uh, for the Scilab community also to mm. say that when I went to this problem, Scilab had this problem. Okay. Whereas I could do this easily in uh, NLI or something like okay, that. Fine. Okay, fine. I'll, I'll do it. Sure. Thank you.